Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Coffee Break. My name is Steve Barrett. I'm the editorial director of PR Week. Delighted to be here with Pam Jenkins, who's the uh, president of global public affairs at Weber Shandwick and also chair at Powell Tate and um, really the linchpin of Weber's public affairs and DC operations. So, Pam, welcome to the show. Great to have you on Coffee Break. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Uh, loving the backdrop, by the way. So we'll talk a bit <laughs> more about that later in the uh, sort of remote working and all that good stuff. First of all, tell us, for those who don't know, tell us about Powell Tate and Weber and how those two fit together and, and your role uh, running public affairs. Are you based in DC or you, do you live outside the city? Or you, what, what's the situation there? Yeah, I was going to say it's hard to say where I'm based anymore. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm based true. in a bedroom <laughs> right now in Maryland. But we are based in Washington, D.C. So Paul Tate is, is Washington, D.C. based. And Paul Tate is our sort of public affairs specialty arm in, in North America. We have sort of small Paul Tate presence in some other parts of the world. But um, it is just a specialty public affairs brand um, where we do work for a range of clients, but um, largely for D.C. based offices and, um, and some government uh, agencies as well. Um, but then uh, that's like one of the anchors of our global public affairs practice, but we have anchors elsewhere in major global capitals um, around the world. And my role, besides being chair of Paul Tate, is I'm responsible for the growth and vitality um, and quality of our global public affairs practice, uh, focusing on uh, talent, clients, um, reputation issues, business growth, and I oversee some offices and specialty brands as well. So, and my role also is to serve as a connector between other practices and our various offerings. That's kind of part of the Weber Shamwick differentiator is how we bring the right people together to solve complex problems and that we're really built for that intersectionality of today's business challenges. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. So I guess you'll have some work that is pure public affairs that you maybe will just do you know, as a, a standalone shop, and then maybe you go in with United Minds or with uh, one of the healthcare brands uh, or, or one of the other practices. So, uh, what, what sort of percentage split would you say it is? Boy, I, I think that's hard to say. I would say most of what we do, we do in collaboration with other practices. In fact, I think that's part of the growth of public affairs is recognizing even in marketing, you can't develop programs without having sort of being mindful of what the political risks are. Part of this is just the government is such a big presence today in business. And so every aspect of navigating around issues requires some sensitivity to, to how to do that with government um, in mind. But also like when you just look at the range of global issues that businesses are dealing with today, public affairs is just embedded in that. So um, I think there used to be, we thought a bit about policy as being this thing over here and your legal people and your government affairs people dealt with that. And now it's really been moved to being part of sort of front and center, how you do your planning, how you do execution, how you prepare uh, for potential risks and when and how you engage on some of the social issues that your employees and your customers are expecting engagement around. Yeah, and you did an interesting report recently on that, where it, which showed um, that home government was actually a massive stakeholder, second biggest stakeholder after customers. Tell us a bit about that report and that work and what it showed about the rise of public affairs. Yeah, we were really surprised by that. So we did a 12 market around the world global study with largely we see CEOs, but other senior um, leaders in communications, in some cases, public affairs. And we just wanted to understand how geopolitics, like how companies are addressing geopolitical risks, how they think about geopolitical tensions, what role does a chief communications officer play when it comes to that within a within a global company? And and what are the forces and, and you know balancing act that every business has to play when it comes to how to deal with tensions, especially when you think about the growing tension with the US and China. Um, but but others as well. And and what we learned was that home country, where your company is based, is considered in most countries by CCOs to be either their most important stakeholder or one of their top three stakeholders. 
And um, I, I think that kind of just took us a little bit by surprise. It makes sense if you think about it, that you recognize your national interests are really important in how you think about um, your framing and how you interact with other with employees from other markets and some of the issues attended with other markets. But uh, something like 78% of those same people said they aren't really proactive about that. They haven't necessarily put processes in place for how you deal with geopolitical um, tensions, but recognize how hugely important it is to make sure you're at least assessing what your national interests are when you're looking at some of those broader uh, Do you think of a practical example of that in action, you know, in a specific case or country or brand or company? Well, it could play out in how you deal with Olympics or how you handle World Cup sponsorships and and um, or even how you handle certain human rights violations in a country where you have a presence and that presence is important. And so, you know, one of the most important things that we tell every client to do, whether this is a geopolitical issue or whether it's an issue within their home country or within the United States, is to be listening to your employees and get a sense from where they are, what their concerns are, and to be communicating. Because the worst thing you can do is not communicate and not acknowledge that these are issues you're grappling with and understand that they're important to people and they need to be addressed. How much do you think that has grown during the pandemic? Because obviously then you've also got this public health layer, which obviously involves governments. And then you've got different policies in different countries. You've got different policies in different states in the US, as we know. Um, How how much do you think that has impacted that rise in in that stakeholder element? Yeah, I, I think it has. I mean, we talk about how, like, especially in US, the the role that government has played and your interaction with government and your expectations around that has like profoundly changed. I do wonder what is gonna happen. Like we're all getting used to having like free testing, free vaccines, free treatment, information flow. Like public health has become like it's surrounded us in a way that we haven't had before, haven't had that in my lifetime. And and what will like what will the expectations be, especially around with some younger people who this is all they know, like people who are just entering the workforce and and and, and adult lives. Like what what is that going to mean two years from now or three years from now? What will they expect when it comes to how healthcare is delivered? So that's just even one sort of aspect of it is healthcare. But I think, you know, the, the, the role of government, um, we, we have seen like an erosion of people's belief that government is going to solve problems at the same time as that, that role has become so big. And they're shifting their focus on businesses, like that businesses now are expected to solve problems that we used to think were government problems to solve. And these are your employees, your, your most important stakeholder who, who expect this as well as customers, as well as other stakeholders. And it has created like new expectations, but also like I think new stresses on, on companies that are global companies on how to meet those expectations, how to create a process for deciding when and how to engage uh, and what are the risks attendant with that. Yeah, I remember speaking to Andy Polanski actually last year and he said that every comms issue now is seen through a public health lens, you know, pretty much every single issue. And it, it, it's really, uh, you're, you're backing that up. And um, it, it, have you found out our PR Week's recent Bellwether survey, which we did with Boston University, really found that C-suites, CEOs were leaning on the comms department a lot more, especially in the pandemic. They'd, they'd finally, some would say, realized the importance of great strategy, council, crisis management, and, and what the comms department can offer. Are you seeing that as well with your clients? And how is that going to impact the sector moving forward? Yeah, a- absolutely. And I, I, I don't think that's going to change after we get more in control of COVID. I think these are changes that are going to be long lasting When I talk about the ascendancy of public affairs, I mean, certainly communications writ large um, has played an enormously important role in helping companies get through thinking about last, you know, last February, March was sort of the great shutdown and how to communicate to your customers what you're doing, how to work with public health. And we brought a lot of public uh, health experts to our clients to help them figure out, can you do what you used to do if you're a 
restaurant chain, or et cetera, and um, what is safe and what is not safe and how you should be thinking about your trade show that you had planned for the fall. How do you, how do you still connect with those customers? And, and every aspect of business operations had to have a really strong communications component so that everyone knew what was happening and why and felt reassured that this company was going to stay strong and, and, you know, and manage through it. So I think the role of a communications leader within an, a company has now become so hugely important, not just to reputation, but to every aspect of, of what they do. And I don't, I don't see that going away. I think the other thing I wanted to mention was like, we all learn from a communications and public affairs standpoint to be more agile. And we created these multidisciplinary task forces to deal with this, this you know, climate changes, um, racial inequities, and, and think about last year after the, the murder of George Floyd, that deeply affected many of our people. And we, and, and we recognize if it's affecting our employees, it is affecting our clients' employees as well. And so we're putting together these multidisciplinary task forces to be able to get on top of these issues, to track, to see what companies are doing, how they're responding, share that with our other clients and understand ourselves, like what we can be doing, what kind of expertise do we need to be able to navigate these things through very emotional debates um, and also with climate and existential threat of, of COVID and knowing how that was different in different parts of the world. These are tough things and you have to be able to move uh, with agility and also with like alacrity. And every day we would meet at five o'clock every day on COVID since January of 2020. When we first talked to our, our colleagues in China, we were just having a corporate public affairs touch base. And they say, yeah, we're going into quarantine. Okay. Quarantine, you know, this is before any of us had even heard of COVID. And we're like, oh my God, we like within a week, we had put out an alert. Nobody knew what we were talking about and, and pulled this task force together because we recognize this is something, this may become very, very big for us. Yeah, you're right. Agility was the theme last year in the Bellwether survey and culture was this year and and, and they're definitely linked. And um, yeah, it's, it's crazy what's happened, isn't it? Just to finish up, tell us a bit about the scene in DC. It's obviously been an interesting five years not dull <laughs> plenty going no. on and it seems to continue although i guess there's a certain sense of a return to normality but even in in this pandemic era it's still a, it's still a, a a new reality isn't it so how's it been for you and your teams and um how do you see it playing out over the next six to 12 months yeah well i mean it's been anything but boring that's for sure i was just this morning on a webinar that we had in from out of Brussels and in, in Germany on the German elections. And the, and the whole theme with that whole presentation was how boring the German election is and how boring the candidates are. We could, we could do with a bit of that. Getting, <laughs> getting worked up about it. But, oh, my gosh, if we could only have a little bit of boring here. <laughs> yes, please. We need that. It is such a tumultuous time still. And, you know, and part, you know, part of the challenge that we see is the spread of misinformation, disinformation, and people live in their sort of tribal bubbles and networks where they're only sort of getting, you know, echo chambers, obviously, we're only getting certain kinds of information and everything else feels very discordant. And when you have that happening, it gets so hard to, to break through that and find those areas of compromise those areas where we can work together and um, bipartisanship. And so there, there's part of me, depending on the day where I get very discouraged, and I think like the sense of bipartisanship, will we ever experience that again? And and even like 9-11 rem reminded us of what unity feels like. Yeah, and, and and we long for that, but it's hard to see in the, in the near term, um, sort of getting there. And hopefully we can around some key areas like infrastructure um, that are so important and, and, um, and areas where we need to, to get on our feet economically. You know, hopefully by early next year, we'll see um, more control over the pandemic. This new very big announcement by the Biden administration last week, that is gonna affect 100 million Americans, uh, 100 million workers that I think is going to have a profound impact on our ability to get people back sort of fully and create a, some sense of normalcy again, which I think all of us uh, uh, really hope for. Yeah, amen to that. Um, our coverage of 9-11 reminded us how the country pulled together at that time across 
all parties, all lines. And the Olympics this summer, actually, I, I love the Olympics for that as well. It brings, yeah. brings the world together. So we yeah, amen to a bit more of that. Thank you, Pam, so much for joining us. Great to chat to you. Great, thanks, appreciate it.